there were evidences for that that's why then we'd have to go back at that time and talk about the philistines talk about evidence of, of markings and archaeological evidence yeah i don't think they could coexist in a one-state solution without a huge amount of violence and exploitation from maybe both sides yeah so if they need a cooling off period aren't they better off having a cooling off period for a few years at least in a two-state situation rather than the palestinians still being state this refugees who are being exploited by Israel. T Tony, you know when it comes to cooling off period, yeah. the, uh, just one recent example rather than going into kind of history and stuff like that. Yeah. A recent example you probably had when um, they were they were told to move from the north to the south. Yeah. Yeah, and they said in the south you're going to be safe. That was, they said, look, that's your cooling off period. We're just going to deal that's in the not, north. That's not what I mean by cooling off. No, but I, what, what I'm saying is that people that these are, uh, Israel as a state has shown that they don't accept a cooling off period in, in any form of, however you fathom it, in the sense that you want to move people from the north, <laughs> from the north to the south. Thank you. you bomb them as they're going south. When they're in the south, you bomb them even when they're in the south, yeah. even when there's a ceasefire, which is the definition of a cooling off period, uh, as of one form of it, you're still bombing them. Yeah. Uh, there's the ITV caught a small example of somebody that they had no weapons, sure. had a white flag. That person was no threat whatsoever. I think we're, that gonna, we're okay. going to agree that what Israel is doing at the moment is appalling and it should stop. No, but what I'm saying is that th this is just to kind of flesh out the point that you said about a cooling off period because there's an assumption there that Israel will be okay and will be loyal to the idea of a cooling off period. And what I'm telling you is that we have enough instances where Israel hasn't been um, loyal to there this may idea. Not be, but again, we're, we're, if we're defining the idea, Ideally, it, of course. Okay, ideally. Yeah, yeah. With an understanding of human psychology, yes. all of these people now were put into one state next week. Yeah. I think whoever was the majority would exploit the minority. Yeah? I think if there was an Israeli majority, they would exploit the Palestinians. And I suspect that the Palestinians have had such an appalling treatment that they couldn't contain their anger if they were the majority. So either way, it wouldn't serve either I, I don't think they would. Um, I think that's what people are fearful that they would. But I don't, I don't think they would. Well, I hope you're right. Yeah. But, okay, even if you're right and they wouldn't, I could imagine that the Israelis would be sufficiently paranoid that they wouldn't believe that the Palestinians could be that um, merciful and accommodating. Yeah? So just to accommodate the Israeli paranoia, pragmatically, it would still seem sensible to keep them apart for a bit, where they're not killing each other for a while. And if you're going to keep them apart for a bit, two-state solution, a temporary two-state solution, serves the interests of the Palestinian people better than still being a refugee camp. Because for 70 years, NATO, uh, the United Nations, has said the Palestinians should have a nation. And we've been appalling in not backing it up because we've let America veto this again and again yeah, and again. Yeah, just last week, yeah. But internationally, for the first time, it seems the public opinion, even in America, is moving against Israel. You've got a 20 to 1 death rate consistently between Palestinians and Israelis. People are waking up to the fact that the Israeli narrative really isn't morally convincing. It really isn't. Um, they're using numerous different strategies to obfuscate the truth. And I'm, I'd love to sit here and break down arguments against Israel so the cows come home. But before I get to do that, I'm always called a Zionist because I still believe in a two-state solution. And that's only because I need to know the answer to a question. And you're on into ethics, so tell me. What should the statute of limitations be on this kind of stuff? Because it's a universal question we need to ask about in international law. And 1948 is 75 years ago. Now, at what point does conquest become legitimate ownership? Because if it was 1948, I'd just be going, Israel is behaving appallingly, the Nakba and all of that, and I wouldn't support a state of Israel in 1948. But if I'm mindful of the statute of limitations, and if I'm mindful of the fact that most of the people in this conflict didn't start it, they weren't around in 1948, they've inherited a bad situation from their forefathers, I think all of those people have rights that should be recognized. And that's the only real argument for the state of Israel I can see is the statute of limitations. So what do you think? I, I can say that when it comes to the two-state solution, this was something even agreed by a specific party of the Palestinians. They had no issues. And that was the, that was the direction that the, the, 
that the talks were being led to that was um, I think uh, even with Yasser Ara Arafat and I mean this was something that yeah all, all that sort of stuff did take place and um, but I think ultimately the the goal and this again is uh, a theory people posit is Israel was never interested in the two-state solution um, they've constantly put either roadblocks ahead of it they violated it and the settlements are clearly a violation yeah, of, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. of a two-state solution and yeah. here you have somebody that's not willing to play by the rules so we can quote statutes but how and what do you do against somebody that's a rogue belligerent state well, that, I think, I think yeah. hopefully you recognize if Israel is say seven million people Netanyahu to me is despicable. Ne not every Israeli is in favor of Netanyahu. There's a spectrum of opinion within Israel. And yesterday, Adnan, last week, Adnan debated a Jewish woman who was terrific. They had a very constructive discussion where she said, within the Jewish diaspora and within Israel, the tide of opinion is turning more and more against hardliners like Netanyahu and towards something like a two-state or even a one-state solution. In fact, she was in favor of a one-state solution. That tide of public opinion is really growing because Israel has in yeah, shamed yeah, yeah. itself for this know, yeah. recent behavior. Yeah? I'm not saying that it's a simple position for them because they got attacked and it is genuinely complicated, but nonetheless, I can't take a 20 to 1 death ratio consistently of Israelis to Palestinians or the way the Palestinians have been treated. Now, I think Netanyahu wants more radical opposition. He would far prefer Hamas, who approached this as a religious conflict, than the PLO, who approached it as a secular real estate dispute. Yeah? So he's encouraged, I think, He's encouraged Hamas because he knows they will alienate so much of the international community that he can then use that for his one-state solution, which is basically the Nakba part to it. It's yeah. kicking out the rest of the Palestinians. So I think Hamas are playing into his hands by framing it within a political framework. If you framed it within a secular framework, you'd have a much stronger platform. And I think international opinion then would fall against Israel, even in America, and you'd really gain some traction. The thing is, there's there's both. There's that secular element. You've got the religious. But just to kind of add to the point that you mentioned, just last week there was an interview of Mehdi Hassan with um, the ex, an ex prime minister of Israel, that said the very thing that you've said. Just in case somebody thinks it's conspiracy theory that Netanyahu is trying to prop up Hamas, that he prefers Hamas. Um, no, this is actually a reality. Well, I don't. Hang on, I'm gambling. When I first yeah. heard the idea, I thought it was conspiracy theory. And then the more I heard about it, when, did you watch um, the debate on Lex Friedman with Finkelstein, four of them, for about five hours? Yeah, uh, I don't know what Destiny was doing there, but... <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say I'll three always, of them. <laughs> I'll always defend the underdog. I know that all he knows is Wikipedia, but you can make good points without having huge amounts of facts, yeah? Nonetheless, in that, they all did seem to agree. You can, but it, like for him, maybe another YouTuber would have been great. Uh, I think, yeah, but he, not he was the weakest. Of the, I yeah. thought the best guy was... He was the weakest link. <laughs> yeah. What was his name? The guy who was with I don't with know, Finkels. I he don't know, but yeah. yeah, he was good. And it was well. a good discussion. Five hours, it was yeah. constructive. Anyway. Um, they all seem to agree that when Israel felt most vulnerable was when they said the Palestinians tried um, a peace offensive, which was being ironic because normally it's a military offensive. That what Israel didn't want, I think, in the around about the time of Oslo, was the idea that the Palestinians might become peaceful. The more extremists like Netanyahu, yeah, yeah, exactly. they want hostility and they want the most extreme form of hostility to rationalise how they can create their one state, which is to eject everybody. So it's difficult. It's, it's actually been said in the Israeli parliament that um, I've actually got the quote yeah. um, where they're saying that Hamas is actually preferred. It's preferred because Hamas will catalyze them getting and usurping more land. Hamas is the perfect opposition for them because you probably had what have majority of the discussions, especially on mainstream media, yeah. been geared towards. I mean, from the get go, whether it's Piers Morgan, whether it's CNN, it all started with do you condemn Hamas? So the whole conversation... I, I think that's a reasonable question, but I think equally you should ask with it, do you condemn the idea? But, but my point is the fact that this whole thing has been centered around this group, mm -hmm. that they are trying to prop up, that they are trying to make it seem like the center of the argument, when the center of the argument is occupation. 
settler colonial yeah. occupation like that's the central that's the crux of the issue right. like like you said there's an extremist party over there you got the idf you got extremists like netanyahu you've got the extremist who um, he's had to um, ben gaver who's in uh, you know the keys let me get umbrellas just in case it's gonna rain I, oh, okay i've got a brawl is that how we can share a brawl or it's, it's up to you yeah, if you want to, you yeah, can. Just in case. yeah, yeah, that's fine. So, yeah, even when it comes to Ben Gavir, who had a picture of a uh, a known terrorist who killed innocent Palestinians, yeah. and he had a framed picture of him in his uh, <laughs> in his office or in his house. So there's a lot of ridiculous, ridiculous stuff. But how the media has made it about an organisation when Hamas isn't even the only like. When we're talking about Palestinian resistance, mm -hmm. Hamas is a faction of that. They're not the only ones that I are fighting. It. I get it. So in order to help me and other people who are laymen to frame it, my assumption is I should start by looking at 1948, yeah? I know the history goes back before 1948, but 1948 seems to be the pivot point for this. And that's because that's when the State of Israel was declared. Is that a reasonable foundational point to start? I think we, it's not October the 7th. October the 7th yeah. is not the beginning of this story. I, I would say back. before. I would say before 1947, because it didn't happen at 1947. And if Israel has been given a state in 1947, that doesn't mean that's when it starts. It means that that is a uh, um, what do they call it? No, like a milestone. Okay. That's a milestone. But in order to reach that milestone, you will have had to traverse something. Like sure. things don't happen in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So similarly, for you to start in 1947, when they've been given a a, a state, uh, well, I, could we say post-war, 45 to 48? That seems to be where. Uh, uh, yeah, starting before. When, for example, um, yeah, I, I think if you are to talk about the whole thing, you talk about the whole thing. To talk about when the Palestinians, the Palestinians were called the Philistines. Talk about when, because now how far back are we going? Because I'm really into the statute of limitations, and when I see Netanyahu and Ben Shapiro, I, I say pre, pre, Canaanite time. Ah, oh, okay. Now we maybe we can have a proper disagreement. Okay. When Ben Shapiro and Netanyahu give their explanation about how we need to frame the, contact, the conflict, their openers are, if you want to understand the conflict, you've got to go back 3,000 years. And my eyes immediately go, no, I don't. No, I do not. Because what I'm looking for, do you know Uma Suleiman? I know Uma, yeah, yeah. Okay, who was again on Lux Friedman. I thought yeah. he was very eloquent on the Palestinian pride. He's in favor of a two-state solution. And he's condemned the international law. He said we need international laws to adjudicate this. Yeah? If we'd had international laws with teeth that treated everybody equally, we wouldn't be in this. Yeah. So the international community should be ashamed of itself. Yes. So you need a framing device for international laws which can work. Yeah. And I don't think you can do that based on arguments that go back 3,000 years. It's just impossible. Yeah. Shall I tell you why he may suggest 3,000 years? You don't have to agree with him or disagree with him. It's the fact that they deny Palestinians were in that land and okay. that there were evidences for that that's why then we'd have to go back at that time and talk about the philistines talk about evidence of, of markings and uh, archaeological evidence and coins etc etc right. that do evidence that the palestinians were there that they have been mentioned in the text when they're trying to wipe us from history okay. sort of so whatever happened to the group of people we never met three thousand years ago how does that change the actual ethics of what happened to people in 1948 who were still alive today who were displaced? I'm interested in the living far more than the dead. So although I want to learn the history of what happened in the past, the statute of limitations I think we should embrace internationally is if you're alive and you committed a crime, you're answered for the crime, and if you're alive and you were abused, then you should be compensated. Yeah? So for example, if you were kicked out of your house in 1948 and you're still alive, you should get it back. Once you're dead, you move into a second ethical category. Because at that point, you've been judged by God. And once you've been judged by God, it's a distinct line that we can understand objectively. Are you alive or dead? If, if alive, still answer. So I think if we could internationally use that as a statute of limitations, a primary statute of limitations, still informed by the history. We need to know the history. You can go back as far as you want, go back 3,000 years if you want. But that's dead history. 
at some point the past becomes the past and I think it's when the individual dies. And that's obviously up, it's up to you, isn't it? It's up to you where you want to start. But I just gave you the, the, the kind of um, reasoning behind why some people would want to go before and would want to start. You can st start when you want. It's a, it's a choice that, that you have. Well, not all starting points are equal. I'm pitching very much the living dead thing. And I think when um, Shapiro and so you think, Netanyahu... So you're, saying past, so, so you're saying that the border that was there at that time, that's the border that we need to be working towards. Because they're there now and we can't, you know, get them to move. So why don't we just stick I, I, with that? Is that? I, I think my, my only argument for the existence of the State of Israel is the peop nearly all of the people there got born there and it wasn't their choice. You're responsible for your choices, not your inevitabilities. Everyone's got to get born somewhere. They, although they gained it through what I think was largely conquest and unfairly, there must come a point in history at which you go, it wasn't your choice to be born here as an individual, I have to now acknowledge you have some rights. Now even though a lot of them, not all of them, have abused that position of power subsequently, nonetheless, because they didn't choose it and they got born into it, to me that gives them just enough human rights that maybe the state of Israel should be considered as ethically viable. It wouldn't have been ethically viable in 48. I think they were a traumatized people. They had the Holocaust. They made very bad decisions. They were very blinkered. And I think the next generations have grown up with very traumatized parents and hyper paranoid. I, I can see the point that you're... Does this make any sense? Yeah, yeah, I can see the point that you're coming with. But the only issue with that would be that if I was a state and I noticed, oh, so-and-so got away with it because um, enough time had el elapsed. Therefore, you know what, you know, like, I'm, I'm, India is following the footsteps of Israel um, in terms of how it treats its minorities, in terms of how it's talking about, in, in terms of the secular, religious aspect, many things. Yeah. Um, so what I'm saying is that it will open the floodgates for other nations and states to do the same thing with disputed territories. You might even see... Use what axiom? My axiom is if you, if you're alive you, or dead. Your axiom seems to be, I have to go back 3,000 years. I think strategically, the Netanyahu's and Shapiro's of this world are using that to obfuscate and confuse the issue. If you just chuck out all the claims that go back beyond living men as being primary, suddenly they can't make those arguments. The second argument they use a lot is God gave us the land. We can't do that in international law either. We can't do 3,000 year claims that's not functional. We can't do God-based arguments. Uh, another argument they use is they go, we cultivated the land in the way the Palestinians didn't, which but, is fallacious. But just because they're making arguments doesn't mean that that's the starting point for us. They can make all the arguments they want. It doesn't mean that their arguments are right or that they're justified. I or think that their arguments are, those three arguments are blatantly wrong. Mm. The 3,000 year old argument, yeah. forget it. You can't do it in international law. The God gave us the land, you can't do it in international law. And the one about we cultivated the land is akin to saying, um, if you bought a car and then you didn't look after it well and polish it, yeah, yeah. then I come by and I go, hey, I'm going to steal your yeah, car I've heard that, I yeah. polish it, right? It's a lousy argument. When you buy the car, that includes your option to not polish it. Yeah. So we, can, we don't need to waste any time being distracted by arguments about God, 3,000 years, or the land stuff. And then I ask, what have you got left? And the only claim I think they've got is to go, look, we've been here 75 years. I'm sorry that it happened immorally and unethically for the most part, but it was also complicated and we're human beings. But Tony, here's the, I think this will encapsulate both of our stances accurately. Yeah. And it's okay to have both stances. We don't have to, you know, agree on one stance. My stance is like that of Malcolm X, which he said that if someone stuck a knife within you, yeah, yeah if they take it out six inches, that doesn't now mean that you should be grateful for that, that you should be happy for that. For sure. Yeah, it's take the knife out, heal the wound. Yeah. yeah, take the knife out. So that argument of, you know what, let's start in 1947, let's two start it's like okay let's take it out six inches it's been taken out six inches it's fine let's just leave it the way it is because of, i'm saying no if that's unacceptable the knife should be removed completely because we need to look at the bigger picture and the bigger picture is we don't want floodgates to open that other nation states start doing the exact same thing I, I, i'm not yeah yeah let's, let's just move down here yeah yeah because you're saying a lot of people walk past and i'm not totally getting your inference that the way we, this is dealt with will 
echo out into all the other jurisdictions like India and so on. I'm not getting how inevitable that connection is. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that let's just say a country has enough power and might yeah. that they um, they colonize a certain land. Once they've colonized a certain land, mm -hmm. um, then people live and they die and time passes and they get certain consulates coming into their areas and you know justifying and saying look we're with you because yeah. they have a lot of international voice time passes generation passes yeah that doesn't mean what they've done is okay i'm not no so you have to write yeah. the history books accurately yeah israel would have to acknowledge the the history of the nakba etc acknowledge that it took the land largely by force and uh, there were a lot of atrocities committed etc if, it that, could, if it could write the history book accurately on those points and go however new generations have now been born here we would like to coexist start by instantly recognizing a palestinian state which should have been recognized for 70 years with an eye to then using that as a negotiating platform towards a one state integration which is the ideal that you and i would both agree yeah yeah on. i got, I got is that, that not a tenable synthesis of look all of the stuff? look both are tenable points okay. yeah the thing is i'm just going up i'm taking the moral argument a bit further than that and i'm saying it's it's unacceptable from the get-go and I understand your thing. Your your thing does claim to be practical, and I'm not denying and the universal. It needs to be international. I mean, for example, yeah. With regard, thank you, to reparations for slavery and all of that. Yeah. If you if the internet until the international community hammers out an idea about what a statute of limitations is, once you've got that yeah. objectively defined, you can apply in all jurisdictions of discussion reparations for slavery, etc. Until then, you're floundering, and it just becomes rhetoric, and you get tactically um, misdirected by people like Netty. I got you. I got you. I, I think your 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 stance is somewhat more balanced than a lot of people, and I think you do look at certain nuances and let some people will agree with that stance as well um, where am I weak where's the weakness in my thinking the weakness is in in what I've said isn't it in terms still of still think it's immoral yeah I do think it's immoral that okay. just because a certain amount of time has passed certain generations have passed um, that that's that now becomes the starting point that that becomes the phase from which you begin I, I'm uh, framing it in religious yeah. terms of the line between when God is judged an individual and has it. I mean, you're, you're, you're religion, Muslim, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of into spirituality generally. And I see such a clear ethical and metaphysical distinction between someone who has lived a life, made their choices and been judged by God, as opposed to someone who is still living their life and still making choices which will then be judged by God. I would have thought that was an objective line that you might... Not, not necessarily, but, but the thing is, Tony, why does it have to be there? Like if, if America cares so much about Israel, they've got enough land and just now they've okayed 23 billion to Israel. In fact, since the beginning, um, estimates suggest that they've given Israel 150 billion. Now, under this, this estimate of 150 billion, if they took this 150 billion and invested it in their own country sure. and gave Israel a nice little spot there, yeah, near California or Florida or wherever, use the 150 billion there, then, you know, I, I, you you save all that money, frankly. I, I, in my heart, I agree. That's okay. okay. If it was 1948, I would say do not, definitely give the Jewish people a stake, which yeah. is safe, but not on that bit of real estate. They naturally gravitated yeah. to the place where their mythology and their heritage was, yeah. and they became blinkered, I think. Yeah. This is my thesis. So I understand why they made that decision and they were traumatized, which cuts them some slack. Nonetheless, it was a bad decision. So in 1948, no. If you could persuade them now to all ship out, <laughs> to a, a from, way, from international my, community could pay for a thing. From, from my but, conversation with you, Tony, yeah. I don't think you're a Zionist. Thank you. I don't think you're unreasonable. Thank you. I think you're being pragmatic. You're exploring both sides. You're listening. And you. And yeah, no, I appreciate that. And and that's that's all we can do. Hear both sides and acknowledge the mistakes of the sides and the hope that what's going on now mm -hmm. will, you know, um, will, with whatever's going, yeah. will happen with the with the, as few casualties as possible. Yes. Of innocent people. Yeah. That's, I that's think what we can also for. do is 
half of the planet are voting this year, four billion people are voting, the tide of public opinion will affect us, and you want to persuade people who are persuadable in the Jewish diaspora and worldwide, yeah? So if you can give fact-based objective arguments that they think are coming from a reasonable source, yeah. they can chew those over and you can affect things that way. Now I put it to you, I talk statute of limitation. I think the one principle I hope we all agree with is the principle of consistency. You can't have two simultaneous things which are in opposition to each other, yeah? An object can't be there and be here. That's the principle of contradiction, yeah? Which is in philosophy and so on. I'm okay with that, but... Okay, I'm okay with that as well. Okay, okay, that's good. This is Plato's principle, but whoever wants to claim it, this is the cornerstone axiom of all inference is that you can't have contradictory situations. So, I can demand consistency from whoever I talk to. Now, I've heard, Israel, I've heard people such as Bill Maher, who generally I rather like, argue that the Palestinians should let it go now. It happened. What do you like about him? I like the fact that he believes there's objective truth and objective reality and it's not woke. I like that he likes freedom of speech. I like that for the most part he's got a good sense of humour. He's quite courageous and he stands up to a lot of trends which might make him unpopular. Um, but I think he and a lot of other people, when it comes to Israel, they get blinkered. Israel, Iraq, yeah. American policy, yeah. he's blinkered in a lot yeah. of things, so even I'm, his view on uh, yeah. Islam as well, I mean, yeah, I, so the clip of well, I'm more, I'm, Ben Affleck and then his discussion with Glenn Greenwald as on well. that one actually I was with him and not with Ben Affleck. Look, I, I, I want to be totally open about who I am and what I believe. I'm not in favour of the more fundamentalist aspects of religion, okay? The reason that I try and get on so well with people in multiple religions, including Muslims, is because I think the core tenets of the practice, etc., are quite probably divinely inspired and good. They do a lot of good for people in practice, and I respect the diligence of their faith and that practice, okay? It doesn't mean I buy all of the small print of the belief system, because I don't. I am in favour of democracy, because I think for all of the bad things that you all have noticed has happened from democratic states, and they have. Democracy is just embodying the notion that I reserve the right to change my mind, to try something and change my mind. That's what's implicit. And I think in all aspects of life, we all live that way. What, what do you think about Plato's view on democracy? Educate me. Go on. I mean, he was, from my readings, he was anti-democracy. He was against the fact that you should give such important decisions to the lay people who just drive the country into the ground. Well, there's an argument to be made there. You can end up with an electorate which is so ignorant that it's... Like some people argue with the happen with Brexit. Most, you can't ignore the strength of that argument as we become more and more sophisticated technologically and economically. People become less and less capable of making informed decisions when they vote. You could counter argue that, okay, you could counter argue that that should tell the society to slow down a bit and not keep accelerating so fast because what democracy appeals to is the idea that the slowest person in the, in, on the train that you're on, you've got to bring them with you. You can't cut them loose. We're, we're, we stick together as a tribe, as a species, and we support the weaker and less intelligent people and try not to run ahead of the game. So it's a balancing. So you think educating the community, yeah, educating yeah, yeah. the country. Maybe if your technology is moving so fast that people can't keep up with it, maybe that's a sign you should slow down the tech a bit. I'm not a don't, don't you think? Don't you think that's a bit naive though to assume that that's even possible? It, like it may be, but I think possibly the consequences of not doing that may be really catastrophic. Because when you've got leaders that are, let's face it, motivated by profit and power. Yeah. Um, not or not motivated by objective morality mm -hmm. um, or a facade of objective morality then they are going to want to line their own pockets stay in power as long as possible sure. and that's going to be against the interests of the people that they are ruling and that's why you've got AI so many people warning against AI warning for controlled measures against AI yeah. but because we're just so interested in getting more and more land yeah. and more more and more influence that's why you're seeing AI being manipulated in ways I mean sure you're familiar with Black Mirror and the likes yeah I've that seen it's Black yeah fantastic yeah uh, in the sense that Charlie Brooker yeah 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 yeah, yeah. done a fantastic job 
but in in the sense that it's now going to be used against these nefarious forces that already have got a lot of control and influence over us yeah. that are trying to Noam Chomsky's word words manufacture our consent just so they can continue their power and influence um, and their, their profit so I don't think somebody that lacks objective moralities some individuals that are part of secret societies that do these there's a bit more of a space opening up between us. I'm not, yeah. When we start talking secret societies, I think there are people out there, but I try and avoid the conspiracy theory. And so am I. That's why I'm keeping it something that we can both agree logically on. Yeah. That there is existence of secret societies. I yeah. think they're there, but I think, I think to a fair extent, they're a reflection of human nature. You tend to interact more with your peer group if you move in rich circles. More and more rich people with more power will naturally interact. Yeah. So a fair amount of that is just what you or I would do in a similar situation. I, I agree. Um, I agree with you. I'm not condoning it. It can yeah. have really bad fallout because you can end up with a bubble of elites with too much money who don't realize the negative impact of their decisions on most of the people down on the ground. That's in the rich poor dividers. But, but you know when it interferes with democracy and a person's duties as a state leader, yeah. that's when it becomes a concern. For example, Bilderberg, Bilderberg meetings. This is something that is now getting more and more traction. People are more and more aware of that these uh, meetings take place of state leaders of um, devil's advocate CEOs yeah why wouldn't the state leaders want to occasionally get together and have a private conversation but let me just finish this point this might okay, yeah this might answer um, your question so when an elected in elected in um, an elected official mm -hmm. alongside um, heads of companies CEOs that are um, risk that are uh, they have a responsibility to their shareholders so yeah. both sets of groups have responsibilities to their dependents to put it bluntly they are meeting in secret there's no minutes to those meetings we don't know what's being discussed we don't know which direction and which mergers are going to happen which are going to affect the money of the awam the people um, share prices are going to go up and down this is i mean insider trading this is this dishonesty this is uh, democratically elected if, if people. They argue that yeah. they're meeting socially. But they don't argue that though. Well, if they did, if they said we're having a social get together. Well, then on paper, that at least yeah. sometimes we'll be talking about business, which is how any of our interactions will happen. I mean, you will naturally probably network with other Muslim commentators here and with camera crews. You naturally in that peer group. Not everybody is in. It's actually, there. mostly with non-Muslims. Actually, <laughs> sorry. It's actually mostly with non-Muslims. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know, we've, we've, I like the world on politics. But just to... I don't, ju I don't want to move too much into conspiracy stuff if you don't. It's, it's, not, it's not conspiracy stuff. I think the rich poor divide yeah. is a real problem. I think you've identified... Do you know, I, do you know Daniel Schmattenberger? I keep trying to big up Daniel Schmattenberger. He talks about the meta crisis, which... Are the multiple... The multiplicity now of immediate problems we're facing that are beyond our control, accelerating technology, economics and population levels running out of control, AI, environmental collapse, and he's framing them all as part of the fact that unless we have some level of global regulation and governance, we can't counter these because everybody in the short term is motivated to compete with their neighbour, even though nobody wants to. Yeah? In the absence of global regulation, which doesn't fall into a dystopic uh, Big Brother state, which is a real but that, that, that falls within the conspiracy, the very conspiracy theory you're trying to move away from, which is a one-world government. Or <laughs> maybe, no, well, he, that's why he makes a difference between a governance and a government. Yeah. yeah. Because he says, we're really stuck between a rock and a hard place. I think that's just semantics. At the end of the day, if you give power to uh, a few people that are pulling the strings, those people can be corrupted, those people can be manipulated, those people, sure. like like the Pope, like certain muftis, etc., uh, etc., et when you centralize power and uh, into kind of one individual but he, problematic. Totally, he totally acknowledges this he says that we're in a position now we've moved to Daniel Schmattenberger and maybe we shouldn't but let me pick him up for a minute because if you see him online hugely articulate and a good guy and with a good spiritual core I think um, he's not just a soothsayer he likes human nature and he's actually very positive so he says our situation right now is akin to somebody who's gone down the bowling yard and you know you've got two alleys and on the left you don't want the ball to go down either alley but these alleys are getting closer and closer together because on the one hand you've got bad short-term in 
incentives that all corporations face and individuals face where if I don't keep competing with my neighbour using yeah. the lowest level possible of human rights or whatever, I'll get kicked out of the marketplace. I want to be a good guy, but my business will go down if a sweatshop, sweatshop in China can undercut me, so now I've got to reduce the wages of my people and so on. So that's the left-hand problem is the world accelerating towards more and more rich poor divide and exploitation, and nobody wants it, but you've got no global regulation to take care of it. So then you've got the other lane, and the other lane is, well, we'll have global regulation. He goes, yeah, but then the problem is there's an incredible probability of a dystopia and exactly the thing we're talking about. And he doesn't pretend it's not the case. His warning is that stuff. He goes, realistically, these are two unavoidable things, two unavoidable problems the species is now facing. Somehow we've got to work out a way of cutting through the middle. Yeah? And Does really, he give a solution? Well, he identifies... A willingness to communicate, just an a willingness to communicate and have more open and educated debates, where you try and open and educated, open debate. and educated where you not, not secret to, meetings yeah, not, in yeah, which not secret meetings. They go on the yachts. When, when, for example, you listen to a debate, you want to listen to the best advocates at each position talking. You don't want one person who's like the world heavyweight champion on their topic, just shooting fish in a barrel with some idiot. I want to discuss. When you say idiot, don't talk about destiny. Okay. <laughs> it's not that. Bad. You want the best representative. For example, when Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson debate, Sam, uh, Jordan Peterson says the person I like to debate most is Sam Harris, precisely because he's my best opponent. He gives me the strongest arguments. He makes me think more incisively. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. So you want that level of debate to be encouraged. Yes. What we've got at the moment is a ridiculously polarised, dumbed-down level of debate occurring. Yes where it's largely about screaming matches and simplicity. You want people to look at the counter-arguments to what they believe. Mm. Steel man your own position. Um, he'll identify, as I think you mentioned, that people being beholden to their shareholders by law means it puts corporate interests ahead of the interests of the wider community. Yeah. Yeah? That's a problem. Also, one you'll like, he identifies interest. Interest which in Islam I think you're against. Yes. He identifies that as being a driving problem because it's... I think even Christians are against interest as well. Well, yeah, interest and money I think is a good thing because you don't want to bar that. But interest is not an inevitable byproduct of money. And interest means that, he will argue, the economies are compelled to keep growing exponentially. And you can't have infinite growth into a finite space. There's got to be a threshold where things start breaking down and we're probably hitting that threshold. So you want to re-question the wisdom of interest, which Islam, to its credit, has done. So there may be an overlap there, uh, another reason why you might want to give him a look. So he's looking at this meta crisis on that level. Thanks for hearing me out on that, because no. it wasn't the topic we started. Yeah, no problem. I mean, look, any theories to how we can limit this, uh, I want to use a word, but I'll use a different uh, this blank beep show um, that that Can we way. Call it the meta crisis. <laughs> yeah, let's call it the meta it's crisis. Okay, the meta crisis. So yeah, there is a meta crisis, and there are definitely certain um, fundamental issues. I mean, uh, Keith, I think um, Keith O'Neill or whatever his name is. I think he's somebody that says that people say it's the Jesuits or it's the, it's the Masons, it's this, it's that. But in his opinion, it actually can be traced down to control of the banking and um, the, the banking sector and the control of money and economy that's limiting people from exercising their moral decisions, frankly. Yeah. Because when you have control over a very important fundamental aspect of life, then it's very easy to control people. I don't know if you've seen his very good movie by, um, uh, it's ironic, the actor's Justin Timberlake, but it's called Time on Time. Yeah, fantastic. The premise is, oh, I, think, brilliant. I, love, you like, I love movies. The premise is superb. It's fantastic. You, but tell you, you might want to tell the audience. Yeah, the so it's, I mean, the, the bartering currency of that time is time. Yeah. Um, that for you to live longer, um, you get more time. And if you're to purchase stuff, you give time. And people that are rich, they obviously have decades and they have years, etc., yeah. etc. So that was a very interesting concept of taking something which is 
somewhat God-given and um, corporatizing it and t turning it into yeah. a thing can, that can be bought and sold. I love that you like that. It's a really yes, I love those an example movies. of how this plays so out in that society you end up so with. So Habibi, how are you right here? Yeah. What were you guys talking about? You don't a, lo mind? a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah at the moment we're talking about corporations and stuff before we talk about Israel-Palestine. That's right, I'll leave you to it. Well, well, like you're in the park for the next few hours, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, inshallah. 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 An example of how this plays out is rich people tend to have buttons yeah. on their clothing, poor people tend to have zips because you can do a zip up faster than buttons. buttons Which movie? Time. In time, in okay, okay. the film you're talking about. Right, right, right. So that's the fashion changes, wow. the clothes that you wear say, I have enough time to do this. Yeah? So that, that's a practical example you can see of how it would affect every tier of activity. Um, I, I like all these, uh, like all these, I would say, um, like certain people have the opinion. I think Dr. Bruce Lipton is a, uh, I think he's the one who said that. Yeah, I think he said that <laughs> uh, Matrix wasn't a movie, it was, uh, it was a documentary. documentary. <laughs> Which I think. If, if we're doing movies for yeah. a minute, yeah. could you indulge me for a, a minute and a half? Yeah. I think this is perfect. And I've discussed this, but I've never shown it before. Hang on. Do you know the IMDB? Yeah. Okay, right. So people know. The IMDB is... Okay. The IMDB is the Internet Movie Database yes. where it's got all of the films and you can vote on a scale of 1 to 10 for films, okay? And that's a printout for a particular film yes. of how popular it was. I'm not sure that's the one I'm going to show you. That's the one I'm going to show you, okay? Mm. So that's a printout. People have rated it from 10 to 1, so 30% of people gave that film a 7. Okay, so you understand what this bar chart is, yeah? So that means most people have voted for that number, yeah? Yeah, it means uh, 17,000 people, 5.4% thought this film was a 9, yeah. and 3.7, 11,000 people, 3.7% thought this. Was a four, so, yeah. that, so they were asked the question, how good is this film? And that's how the curve came out, okay? Do you want to guess what film that is? Don't worry, I'll just tell you on the first one, but this one. That film is The Fast and the Furious, okay? I only mention it because most people know what it is, and yeah. you go, okay, I can believe that's the curve you'd get. I'm going to show you three more and you'll get the punchline, okay? Next one. Do you want to guess what film that is? If you, uh, even Fast and Furious, I wouldn't have guessed that. <laughs> I just wanted to do the, the one which was an average. Now, from this, you can see it's got overwhelmingly positive, but it's still got a curve on it. I'd probably attribute that to the like of The Godfather. Okay, nice try. Yeah, actually Oppenheimer. Oh. I'm being topical, okay? So this is Oppenheimer. Now let me show you that, and then we'll get to the point. There is a punchline. Okay, this film. You want to take a guess? Because okay. you're being topical, I'm thinking you're going through some recent ones of Barbie. Well done. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, it's Barbie. And the reason that's Barbie is you'll notice, although it's got that realistic curve, there's a bit more at the ends here where it was more controversial. So some people going 10, some people going 1. Yeah? Uh -huh. Okay, so now I'm going to bring this back on topic. Do you want to guess what that is? Ooh. Ooh. Wow. Yeah, wow. You won't know, and it doesn't matter, okay? That is a documentary called Israelism, okay? Which I haven't seen, but I hear it's made by some Israeli younger people in Israel who are of the opinion that their culture's been brainwashing them towards Zionism and they've had an awakening, yeah? Okay. okay? And what you're seeing here is this insane polarization where everyone thinks it's either the best thing ever made or the worst. Now, I haven't seen it, but what I know is that's not a healthy situation. When people's perception of reality lacks any nuance that we saw in the other ones, uh -huh. you lose the ability. You lose the ability to make any kind of objective critique of your own position or the other person. All you can ever do is point at them and go, you're wrong. Yeah. And you're correct. If you look at them, they're clearly wrong. So I can stand here, point at them and go, you're wrong. Yeah. And I can stand here, point at them and go, you're wrong. Yeah. But nobody's being right anymore. Rightness means having a bit more nuance. Which you have had in our discussion, and that's why. Thank you. Yeah. So was that worth chucking? Uh, well, I, I like that sort of stuff, like the. Uh, I'm into that sort of stuff. I, I appreciate art in whatever form. Art is art. Great. 
Okay, this is going way too well. How, how do we how do we turn into a screaming match? I think let's let's leave it there for now, and then let's touch base later. I mean, yeah, it's nice to have some wins sometimes. It's nice to yeah, absolutely leave things at a positive juncture. Yeah, I'm totally. This has been a real breath of fresh air. Seriously, thank you so much. My pleasure. Really? I had a feeling it was going to go like this anyway, because I've uh, obviously. I actually didn't. I read you wrong, and I'm sorry. No, no, I, I've right. seen some of your videos, and for some reason, I got the impression that. Yeah, I, I was surprised by that as well, because normally uh, I really get that sort yeah, of. No, I was definitely wrong. Yeah, and it's yeah, always yeah. nice to discover you're wrong. It's often yeah. more, it's more interesting to discover you're wrong than that you're right. Oh. So, good. Thank you. My pleasure. Cheers, I'll just take these off you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll just take these. So there's one at the. This was at the top. And this was at the bottom. Which one was at the top? Top on the top. Top, okay. And this is Jabi's one, yeah? Yes. Where's Jabi? Let me 